Thank you for joining this conversation on guaranteed income. My name is Autumn McDonald, and I'm the head of New America California. New America is a think and action tank based out of Washington, DC. And New America California's efforts are focused on issues of economic equity, community voice, and community agency. Please feel free to take the conversation online by using the hashtags guaranteed income and tagging at New America California or at New America or our speakers. Our guests today are the mayor of New Orleans, Latoya Cantrell. Thank you for being with us, Mayor Cantrell. The mayor of Gainesville, Lauren Poe. Thank you for being with us, Mayor Pope. The mayor of Oakland, my mayor, Libby Schaff. Thank you for joining us, Mayor Schaff. And the mayor of my hometown, Cambridge, Sambul Siddiqui. Thank you for being here, Mayor Siddiqui. I don't feel that we can begin without note of the day. And while some are considering George Floyd a martyr, I believe we should all remember that he did not give his life for justice or for a movement. He wanted to live, he begged to live. So I ask that we all strive to commemorate with our works and our action. Thank you again for being with us today. Thank you all for joining us. And I'll start with a general question to all of our mayors. And I will point out so you can know who I'm talking to first. Um, I will start with you, uh, Mayor Poe. If you could tell us just briefly your journey of your engagement with guaranteed income. A sort of, you know, you heard about guaranteed income, you learned about it, then you heard about, you know, what was going on with the Stockton experiment at point W, or, and then you had such initial uh, thoughts, et cetera. Uh, if you could just take a few minutes to kind of take us through your journey with guaranteed income briefly. Yeah, thank you, uh, Autumn, and, and thank you, New America, for hosting this. It's such an important topic, and i uh, really thrilled to be uh, here with such outstanding mayors. Uh, so I first uh, learned about the, the Stockton uh, Guaranteed Income Project last summer. Uh, I, I think it was probably through uh, Twitter or something like that, uh, and then shortly after, connected uh, both through Mayor Tubbs uh, and Cameron, who had been working um, and still is working on uh, the Mayor's for Guaranteed Income project. Uh, and so we started some conversations, um, how uh, I and Gainesville might support uh, uh, furthering the efforts. Uh, they were especially looking for some Southern cities. Uh, they had some uh, good buy-in in, in um, California and, and the Northeast, uh, but the South was not well represented. And so we started having a series of conversations about what that might look like. Uh, uh, at, at that same time, we have a local nonprofit uh, called Community Spring, who uh, is focused on poverty alleviation, and they uh, ran their own uh, direct cash assistance program, privately funded, uh, last summer during the height of the COVID pandemic. And so for me, um, point A and point B connected really well. They, they had a little bit of experience with direct cash payment. They were uh, rooted in our community. And so we started uh, pulling them into the conversation. And by the end of uh, 2020, uh, we were fully on board. Uh, we're looking at how to uh, design and develop a pilot, uh, how to uh, secure funding. Uh, and we also uh, were able to uh, narrow our target population to returning neighbors, uh, folks that, that were leaving incarceration. Uh, that's where uh, Community Spring had done a lot of their community work. And uh, it's also a group we know that is uh, incredibly underserved and faces some of the highest barriers um, uh, when, you're, when you're looking to alleviate uh, poverty. Uh, and so it all came together and we're looking to uh, send out the first checks, hopefully uh, October 1st of this year. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing a little bit of the background of how you came to be connected with this. Mayor Siddiqui, I'd love to hear the same, just when you first heard about it, point W, point Y, point whatever you want to call it, but your, your process. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's great to be here uh, to talk about this. So I, it's a similar story. I uh, learned uh, about uh, MGI um, late summer last fall um, and Prior to that, uh, as a city, we were you know, wrapping up the Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund uh, assistance in Cambridge that uh, really has existed in prior years for disasters related to fire. Um, and we quickly pivoted that 
uh, to um, raise ultimately about $5 million, uh, really the beginning of which went to individuals. And so I was really thinking about how to continue supporting our residents in the most need. Um, and it was great to see the, the data showing how requiring uh, cash assistance was improving uh, people's lives, not only financially, but also positively impacting uh, participants' mental health, personal uh, investment, and other outcomes. So I quickly reached out to MGI, uh, Cameron as well, um, and really in October, November, uh, uh, you know, I started talking to local organizations who I thought would be really critical, uh, including our Cambridge Community Foundation, uh, who would be critical in the uh, pilot project's success. So really started like that. Um, and we're, hope, we're hoping to have our first disbursements uh, go out in August. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that. Mayor Cantrell, I'd love to hear about your engagement. Well, thank you again, you know, for having me. And it's good to be here with uh, my sister, sister mayors and, and brother mayor as well. Um, my first interaction and in, in learning more about guaranteed income really came from my brother, brother mayor Tubbs. You know, I, I, I got connected with him uh, after being elected myself and, and kind of us, we were elected almost around the same time. At any rate, um, I saw what he was doing, taking those bold steps and being innovative in, in, in the approach. And I wanted to know, you know, how could I be down, you know, and particularly <laughs> um, just with getting the resources because the need is absolutely there. Um, I know from growing up and single mom went from welfare to work, a little bit of something can really help you a long way. And you just need that little bit of help to get over the hump. But once you're over the hump, you're rolling. And so I um, think about guaranteed income just from, from that perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's not a handout. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a really a hand up, but it's to get people what they need in that moment and over the course of time so that they can be well, they can be healthy. And in the city of New Orleans, um, being not only majority African-American, but those stricken, you know, poverty conditions, disparity gaps that exist around, you know, wealth and of course health, but even the post-Katrina environment where the wealth gap hasn't, hasn't shrunk, it's actually grown larger. And of course, being in the midst of a pandemic, it always brings front and center your most vulnerable people. And so with that, um, I hooked up with, with Tubbs and he brought uh, uh, partnerships to the table, resources to the table. And here we are you know, with a program uh, working with my, the Mayor's Office of Youth and Families that we're hopeful uh, to start August of this year, July, August of this year. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And Mayor Schaff. You know, I'm gonna kind of back it up a little bit. Um, and, and, and go back to 2005 when I was working for then mayor of Oakland, both past and then future governor of the state of California, Jerry Brown, uh, and representing him on a board of an organization he helped start called the Family Independence Initiative. Mm. And it's really where my awareness uh, of just how deeply poverty is a policy failure, not a personal failure and how our current systems make being poor a full-time job uh, that robs people of their dignity, that literally asks them to document deficiency on an ongoing basis and uh, robs them of, of agency. And the Family Independence Initiative was really founded to try and get around that and used unconditional cash uh, as a piece of, of pulling people on their self-appointed journey to self-sufficiency. Self um, so fast forward to when I became the mayor myself of my beloved hometown of Oakland. Uh, also, you know, got to work with Michael Tubbs, Mayor Tubbs all the time as one of the big California city mayors. And uh, when he reached out to me, uh, he sent me a text because he is an obsessive texter uh, unapologetic emoji user uh, and said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of creating this 
national organizations, mayors for a guaranteed income. I think I said, I'm so in, or I'm hella in, or I, I said something right away that Cameron told me they actually printed out my text and put it on the wall uh, because I just was hair on fire about the idea that this system, which really lifts up the true roots of poverty and how we as government are not solving it we're, we're almost trapping people in it mm -hmm. uh, and that that has got to change. The narrative has got to change and uh, just have been so excited to be a founding member. And then when I got a call from Blue Meridian Partners and was invited to pitch a vision of a partnership with them that would accelerate recovery from COVID, uh, particularly around economic mobility, I knew that a guaranteed income demonstration in Oakland was my highest priority. That is what an equitable recovery looks like. And it um, is very exciting to be launching a guaranteed income demonstration that will be serving 600 families in Oakland starting literally next month. Well, that's fantastic. I love that you all talked about kind of how you learned about it and talked a little bit about your excitement for it um, and what, what makes you feel like this is not just a good idea, but something that's really critical and important. My question is, and you started into this a little bit, Mayor Schaff, what are some of the misconceptions you, you started to kind of address, you know, what it does do? Um, what do you feel, what are the challenges you're hearing? What are, what are people saying, no, no, don't do this because... Uh, and I'll start with you, Mayor Chef. What are some of the misconceptions out there? Uh, I think one misconception is we can't afford this. Like it's crazy. We can't give all poor people cash all the time. And um, I would say that we can't afford not to. The cost of poverty is so tremendous on our society and on our governments. And I believe that the demonstrations in cities like ours are gonna show that investing in people's health and well-being and stability is the best investment we can make, not just morally, which is first and foremost, but actually financially. The other misperception and Stockton's demonstration did a great job of debunking this myth is that if you give people money, they won't work. And one of the most powerful pieces of data that came out of Stockton was that if you give people money, they are actually twice as likely to become fully employed. That that instability is actually what is holding people back from getting that job, from being able to get a babysitter for their kids so they can go on that interview, uh, from being able to take that unpaid internship that actually leads to a huge upgrade in income and responsibility and the dignity of work. Uh, so I love how uh, the hard data is so clear. And then the big surprise is just the huge impact on mental well being and how that impacts everything from how children get raised and whether or not they're experiencing ACEs, which which will have a lifetime impact on their brain development and, and functionality uh, to you know, how we as a community uh, have healthy, happy, contributing people. Um, those are just a couple of the myths that I think need to be disbunked, debunked. And I appreciate, I think we all have committed to not just gathering data on our uh, guaranteed income demonstrations, but also contributing that narrative because the narrative must change about what causes poverty. It is not lazy people. It is a system that is broken and unjust. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can feel the passion. And so I'm curious for Mayor Cantrell, Mayor Pill, Mayor Stiki, when you think of these kind of misconceptions, are there any particular stories like it's one person's story, three people's story. Is there one, is there something that kind of comes to mind that speaks to like the flip side of whatever said misconception is? Uh, I, I guess for me, you know, it's personal. 
uh, I, I was that kid, like, <laughs> um, and, and seeing, you know, my mom go from welfare to work and how uh, just a little bit of resources, whether she got it from, you know, my, my grandmother or even that she got from, from LA County, for example, um, she used it wisely to get the training she needed uh, to raise her children and have a successful life and retired as a clinical social, social worker from Orange County after 35 years. So I've lived it and it, I'm just so, it, it, I'm so connected to it in that way. Uh, and hearing all of the uh, misconceptions, um, I guess my entire life, you're on welfare or you're poor, you know, you don't want to work, you're lazy, um, you know, and, and it's racial as well. You get into the black and the brown, you know, in terms of that. And so uh, for me, it was demonstrated in my home and in my family and in my community that just a little, a, a little bit can get you over that hump and to get you well on your way. And in, in our city, I see the need and absolutely know that we can get people to pivot to a more sustainable um, quality of life if we give them the opportunity. And so this is just another way uh, for our people to meet their immediate needs and then be able to start to place themselves uh, into a more uh, uh, just environment in terms of training and workforce so that they can be whole and they can be dignified. And there's no better time, in my opinion, than now uh, for us to get this guaranteed income uh, pilots off the ground and demonstrate in a much larger way across the United States of America. And so that's why I'm so excited about mayors for guaranteed income. That's outstanding. And I appreciate your kind of sharing even the, the personal connection as well. I think that for a lot of people, it's personal. And I'd love to hear, uh, Mayor Siddiqui, if there are any stories um, through your own life or others that you um, think are compelling and you want to share. Yeah, similar to, um, you know, Mayor Control, I think for me growing up in Cambridge and growing up in affordable housing, uh, I've seen just how unaffordable uh, Cambridge has become. Um, and so having that deep and intimate understanding um, of how big, you know, these economic um, gaps really are, um, and then seeing it as mayor uh, and, and seeing it when we get calls to our office saying, you know, my car got towed and I, I don't have that hundred dollars to go and first I have to pay the ticket and now I have to go get it, get the car. Um, and you know, if I don't get the car, there's a fee associated with keeping that car. So, you know, that's just one example of what I what I've seen, what we've seen here of that direct cash assistance um, can really help um, our families. And here, our focus with Cambridge Rise um, recurring uh, income for success and empowerment is what we're calling our pilot. Uh, we are you know, really focusing on our single caretakers who we've seen. Um, who, you know, are, uh, you know, 20% of whom uh, in Cambridge earn uh, an average of 13,000 a year. Uh, so, you know, really using that data and, and um, those stories to, to make sure that we, you know, really are focusing on um, the issues that are at the forefront for these, um, for these communities is key. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And Curious, Mirpo, if there are specific things, either a story or as it relates to misconceptions, is there like a specific argument you're hearing from any naysayers in your in your um, in your city? What are what are the the main thing that they're like? Come on now. Oh yeah, no, uh, I I think um, you know, let's name it right. Uh, there's a very old trope that poor people don't know how to spend their money correctly, and that's why they're poor. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's um, both a classist and typically racist uh, uh, argument that's made. Uh, and, you know, so let's take a step back for a moment. And, and we, we don't ask our senior citizens to validate how they spend their Social Security check. We trust them with that payment. Uh, we haven't asked people how they're going to spend their 
uh, expanded uh, child tax credit, by the way, make it permanent. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, are you going to spend this on your children? Show us how. Uh, but yet, when we talk about giving assistance to people living in poverty, we want to control how they spend that money. We we take away their agency. Uh, and that's especially true of our population, of our neighbors returning from incarceration. Um, we, we basically say, we don't trust you with anything in your life. We're going to make you validate every breath you take. Um, we know from the Stockton experiment that none of those uh, tropes are, are true. And we've known that for a long time, right? But now we are, are gathering data and saying, look, if, if we give money without any strings attached, what are you going to spend on? Well, we know they're going to spend it on food on housing, on utilities. Um, uh, they're able to prioritize their decisions based on their immediate needs uh, to help their family in the best way they know possible. Uh, and, and so th those are the sort of headwinds we're fighting um, that, that somehow uh, the larger they believe that uh, they can make better decisions for individuals and families about how they spend their money. Uh, and I think what all of us are out to prove is that is absolutely 180 degrees off of where the truth lay. Um, that, that when you give folks uh, money, they know exactly um, what they need to do to best serve their family. I appreciate your saying naming it. We're just going to name it, right? So I'm hoping that this will continue to be a conversation where we just name it, name all the things. And so I know you have talked about, a few of you have talked about the boldness that you saw in Mayor Tubbs as the first one to lead a uh, mayorally led uh, pilot. I have a two part question for you, and I'm not going to direct this one. I'm just going to let you guys jump in as you see fit. So on one side, there's this element of, are there certain populations that you feel like would benefit more so for, for in terms of other targeted populations that you are hoping to start a pilot with or continue to build in terms of um, providing cash. And then the second part of that is how are you seeing the um, just this, the, the issue of equity? Like, let's just talk equity as you talk about how you're targeting. Um, who wants to jump in there? Oh, I'm happy to jump in because um, I've, I've definitely gotten uh, quite a quite a slap back. I'm, I'm already popular on Fox News, um, but this this made me more popular. Um, we we are really being uh, open and honest about targeting our uh, guaranteed income for BIPOC families, and we have documented the huge disparities in income and especially wealth by race. To us, it, it provides the clear evidence of systemic racism at work, baked into our systems. And we really see guaranteed income not only as you know, something to heal our communities and do our job as government, but to also address the racial inequities that we see uh, so clearly. In Oakland, uh, black families are three times more likely to live in poverty. Uh, white families have three times the median income. Uh, I believe nationally, the wealth gap between black and white families is 10 times. Uh, these are clearly racially uh, generated disparities that should be named as such. And guaranteed income, I believe, is going to be one of the fastest and most clear ways to address the racial disparities. So we are targeting BIPOC families. Uh, we are not gonna exclude anybody because we, we certainly you know, are not inviting a lawsuit, but we are intentional in our targeting and we are targeting families because we believe that when children grow up in stable households, uh, that that benefit lasts for, for years and for a whole new generation. Uh, we would like to provide it to everyone, but to the extent that we are focusing in a little bit, it is on households with a minor child. Anyone else thoughts on targeting and equity? Yeah, well, I think everything has to be in, in centered around equity, especially if you are in a community uh, that has been disproportionately impacted on every single level for generations. 
um, the challenge here in the city of New Orleans was identifying because the needs are so great. Um, but what we did settle on was focusing on our youth, particularly between the ages of 16 to 24. Um, and we are saying our opportunity youth, those who are unattached from school uh, and or work, um, our program these young people uh, that we have identified, of course, um, working with partner uh, organizations throughout the city that um, work with and support our youth. And so this is an extremely vulnerable population in our city and we just wanna leverage these dollars to ensure that they can you know, meet their basic needs and then transition them into a job or training or education programs, again, so they can be back on the road uh, to success and live a productive life um, in, in the city that they love. And so that's what we're targeting a uh, 16 to 24. And um, it's exciting because this is a, a real need in our city at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about our target population. It's, it's a, a population that, um, you know, most people turn their backs on uh, folks that neighbors returning from incarceration. Um, even their own families will often turn their backs uh, on them. Uh, and, and so there's just not a lot of support out there, you know, and having paid their debt to society, uh, we put a hundred bucks in their pocket and say, good luck. Uh, you know, you, you, that's, that's one night in a hotel and a, and a, and a hot meal. And then what, you know, what, what's, what does day two look like? Uh, and so, you know, when, when you talk about equity, uh, really realigning resources uh, to help the folks that need it the most. Um, that's exactly uh, how we chose our target population. Uh, this obviously will be a huge benefit to our community overall uh, when you have folks that are stable coming out of the, the penal system, uh, when they're able to uh, you know, take time to you know, find a, a stable place to live, a, a, a job. Uh, and, and we're combining this with other initiatives. Um, we're we're um, right now passing an ordinance to um, uh, prevent employers from asking about uh, incarcerated status uh, until the point where they would be considered to be hired. Um, and this is this program is also designed by the affected parties. Um, so um, the the folks that that put most of the effort into to designing how this uh, um, direct cash payment program would work are all formerly incarcerated, have gone through the, the challenges and um, discrimination uh, that, that you know, the, the participants in the program will face. And so uh, we feel really good about uh, sort of redirecting uh, our resources to uh, focus on equity um, and, and really change the life trajectory of, um, you know, in our case, 115 people. And I think just reflecting on what everyone said, I think the, the most interesting part about being involved um, in this movement is that you can see a variety of pilots um, and, uh, you know, looking at the diversity of demographics that each pilot is focusing on. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of key learnings, right? It, it's, you know, we're talking about single caretakers or we're talking about um, you know, reentry population, uh, youth, um, BIPOC communities, artists in other cities. So it, it is um, is really important uh, that we uh, have these models to to see um, you know what uh, uh, what the benefits are. Uh, and equity, you know, is at the forefront. Uh, as I said in Cambridge, we use that data. We we saw um, where um, you know the we saw where our families are struggling the most. 70% uh, of those families were headed by a single caretaker. Uh, and then we saw how COVID, working with our nonprofits, our housing authority, uh, we saw how this the pandemic has really impacted um, our single caretakers. So, um, it, it, you know, we always talk about this notion of a financial vaccine. Um, and I think um, it, it really is critical um, with having uh, something like a guaranteed income. Mr. Dickey, you mentioned the 
you know, the impact of COVID. There's been, uh, some would say there's been some momentum in terms of this issue. Uh, and I actually saw a stat, I think it's in The Economist, uh, that conservative support of guaranteed income is up from 28% to 45%. Uh, and some see this kind of movement of people having greater support for it as COVID related. Uh, what is it that you guys are seeing, thinking as it relates to how COVID has shifted the narrative or is it is there some element of it that's like there are just so many more people now who really need this type of support? Um, what what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I think the momentum is is critical um, as we continue to collect data uh, that shows a, a guaranteed income uh, is essential to to address these decades of economic um, inequity um, and to show this to our federal um, and state leadership. Um, I, I know that these pilots. Most cities can't uh, be financially sustained uh, indefinitely. Um, so we'll need a lot of federal and state uh, financial support to continue them. So seeing that momentum grow and to see um, you know, the, some of the bipartisan uh, support really does give me um, a lot of hope. Um, and so I think um, it's, 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 a, it's a great momentum to see it. And yes, it's COVID related, but I think it's um, it's better to have that than not, right? And I think we're reimagining. COVID has been horrible, but it's also taught us so many lessons. And uh, I think it's enabled us to uh, be more urgent uh, and not study the problem anymore, right? There's all these studies we could do. That's what comes up. Uh, and this is actually providing and giving us that momentum. So it's really important. And real quick, Autumn, I, 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 most Americans have received a direct cash payment twice over the last 12 months, uh, and not a lot of people complained about it. I think a lot of people needed that and put it to good use, and it was a lifeline. Uh, I, so I think the story has gotten a little easier to tell about why this works and why it's so important based on direct experience by most people um, because of COVID. And I would just add that, you know, you say it's COVID related, but the bottom line is it's disaster related. And it's not a matter of if, it's when. So there will be another <laughs> coming our way. But what is always um, uh, revealed in every crisis is that the most vulnerable people are the ones who suffer the most. And so while we're seeing it through COVID, again, it's not a matter of if, it's when, it's the next one. And now, you know, I agree with, with, with Mayor Sue. Look, we know this we've been knowing long time. So the study's over, like, let's get to it. And so that's what I'm most excited about, like doing the work and, and seeing some action. And so when I see from 28 to 45%, like that's progress. And I think that with the work of the mayors that are on uh, this, this panel right now, um, through our work and our efforts, we'll see hopefully that increase from 45% you know, up to, to 95% because we would have demonstrated that our people need it. They put it to work. It alleviates stress. You know, it, it helps our folks focus on raising their children, getting an education, better opportunities. And so we all deserve that. So. That's such a huge point, right? Like it's, it's about how do people deal when there's disaster, when there's there's upheaval and that's always right because there's not a time where there isn't some sort of a, a thing uh i would love to get a sense from you guys uh, about what are your tactics for engaging the community at new america new america california specifically we are really thinking about narrative change but specifically how the piece of people with the lived experience are the ones, those are the voices that people are listening to when they're thinking about what needs to happen, what the policy needs to be, what the strategy needs to be, that those are the ones that actually have the great influence, right? So my question to you is, as you think about the water narrative and how it is to some extent potentially changing, what are your thoughts on how you're engaging the community and those who may be recipients or, or just every, everyday folks, everyday residents? I can start. Uh, for us, Cambridge Rise is 
comprised of a lot of uh, local organizations who have been collectively uh, working together over the last year uh, to launch our pilot. Um, so we have a outreach subcommittee uh, that's taken on this task of formulating a plan to ensure that every resident uh, who's eligible to apply for the lottery has the ability to do so, you know, in several languages, um, online and in paper format, uh, and through cross-sector outreach efforts. So uh, because the team, the founding team is so connected to our nonprofit organizations uh, and our local housing authority, uh, we, we have a really a strong pulse of you know, who our constituents trust uh, for additional services and know that you know, it's going to be really all hands-on uh, uh, effort. And that includes working with our schools. We have family liaisons who are in our schools who work closely with families who, who can identify families. Uh, we're, we're targeting post, postcards to families and uh, all the most common languages to get information out on applying, uh, you know, we're, we're having these targeted focus groups uh, to ask, you know, residents important questions. So those are some of the engagement, but really it is on the ground, having that information in the laundromats and the food pantry line, the salons, uh, barbershops, you name it, places of worship. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of different engagement strategies. I'll, I'll chime in. Um, in Oakland, we've stood up a collective impact organization called the Oakland Thrives Leadership Council. Um, and they uh, have been a, a huge support in the outreach. Uh, and it's a coalition of all the different public agencies, including the school district, the county government, all our healthcare providers, a ton of our big nonprofits, um, faith leaders. I mean, just, you know, everybody's at this table. And so we have, even though, you know, we haven't even started one important part of our strategy, which is straight up door knocking, old fashioned door knocking, um, already <laughs> just with the oversight of the collective impact organization, we have 9,000 people who have already registered to receive an application, even though we haven't gotten to the deepest part of our outreach strategy yet. Um, you know, like was said before, we're obviously, you know, leaning on the trusted messengers, which I think we've leaned on more than ever during this difficult year of COVID. Uh, and just physically going to the places where we know the people we want to reach are there. And, and Autumn, I think it is worth saying, um, because I think we assumed people knew uh, the difference between guaranteed income and base, universal basic income. Uh, I think we are all targeting this particular unconditional cash to people who are poor, to people who have low incomes. And UBI, universal basic income, goes to everyone regardless of their wealth. Uh, so just, just wanted to throw that, that clarification in there. because you. UBI is fun to say. People say it all the time. It's more fun to say than GI. It sounds like a, a stomach <laughs> issue. Um, but uh, it's important to see that distinction because I think we've all done that targeting as part of our demonstrations. Thank you so much. I think that's a credible point that we should have started with. So thanks for making that clarification. I have so many other questions for you guys and I wanna just kind of go through a few of the bigger bucket ones. Uh, but I'll ask if, you, if you're if you willing to uh, kind of give your kind of quick answer to these so that we can get to as many as possible. Uh, what about the folks who say, why wouldn't we just do a federal jobs guarantee? Why wouldn't we just, you know, gave, have greater flexibility in the existing safety net? Uh, why don't we find some other way other than giving people cash? What do you say to that? Anyone who wants to answer. Why not? Autumn, I'd say we do it because it works. Yeah. We know that from the, the Stockton experiment at the beginning, Mayor Schaff uh, sort of went over some of the highlights, uh, people twice as likely to find full-time work. Um, I wish we had the graphic. I know that that's uh, Mayor Schaff, you've seen this, and I think Mayor Cantrell, maybe all of you, the, um, the mental health improvements are phenomenal. Any community 
if you were able to say, we have something that will only cost you X number of dollars and you'll see this level of improvement in people's mental health, regardless of their income bracket. But especially if you could say, this is gonna benefit our lowest income, most marginalized neighbors, they would say, absolutely, sign me up. We've been trying much more expensive solutions for decades and decades and none of it's working. And, and so uh, if you care about people, if you care about their health, especially their mental health, uh, if you care about uh, restoring hope and dignity, if you care about uh, returning agency to neighbors who have had it taken from them over and over and over, then you should support this because we've seen that it addresses all of those uh, things in remarkable ways. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to circle back to your last question, just dovetail on it uh, with it a little bit. Um, part of all of our projects are it, it, the part of the point. Yes, it's to help people in our communities, but it's also to build a narrative and to gather data to make an argument of why this makes sense on a national level. Um, th there's no way that every community across the country can do this on a city by city basis. Um, a lot of communities don't have the resources um, or maybe the, the, the um, will. Um, and so regardless of our target population or our current circumstances, building that scientifically viable data set and the qualitative narratives that each of our programs will have. Uh, we will each pull out a cohort and they will be our storytellers and they will give you the real lived experience. Um, will, you know, I believe change the perception by many of those folks who might be opposed uh, at the beginning, not knowing as much about the, the programs. That is such a great point. And it also leads to this element of what is the like the, the the winning argument, if you will. Like what is the lever where you say you point to this thing and that's the thing that's really going to convince folks. So we we get that there are some folks who are gonna say, I get it, and it makes sense, and they maybe don't have preconceived notions about, you know, what what is fair for, you know for those living in poverty or they don't have all these kind of heavy things where they decided what, what people are, are worthy of. But if you were to say, let's try to get this at a federal level, if we were trying to bring this at a state or federal level, what do you think is the argument that shows the return on investment? What is the argument that makes people say, ah, you're right. Do you believe it's, it's the health element? Uh, what, what do you guys think is the element that convinces. Well, Autumn, that's what we're trying to, to do. We're trying to create that body of evidence yeah. and that body of stories. Uh, and, and someone asked it in the chat, we are all committed to doing both quantitative and qualitative evaluations. Uh, it is one of, one of the many awesomenesses of Mayor Michael Tubbs. Um, is that this movement has not just created a national coalition of mayors from every kind of community across this country. Uh, talk about a powerful lobby. Um, our communities are America, uh, but has also helped stand up a center for the study of guaranteed income. And the fact that in each of our communities, we are doing the gold standard of evaluations, randomized control trials. Uh, so that evidence is, is going to be solid, uh, but the stories, the, the narrative, that, that is just as important to each and every one of us. And the, the kind of architecture of support that Michael Tubbs has created uh, is, is one that is really helping each and every one of us not just do these demonstrations, but actually make sure that these pilots are on a path to permanence. A uh, number of people in the chat have said, what are you gonna do after 18 months? Well, our hope is to change federal policy. And, and Autumn, if part of that is re-examining uh, re how the current benefits work, if part of that is re-examining a federal job guarantee, you know, these things are worthy of re-examination. And, and the fact that these conversations are happening 
uh, is really encouraging. But we are on this mission to amass a body of evidence that demonstrates so clearly and so unequivocally that guaranteed income is the best investment you can make in human potential. There, there is no better payoff or leverage than that. And Mayor Control, I saw that you were had something you wanted to share as well. Thank you so much for that. No, Michelle. well, Mayor, um, let me really um, uh, sum, summed it up. You know, um, some of your questions were, you know, how would, what would we say to those who don't, look, we don't have time to be spending a bunch of time trying to convince somebody, okay? We're about the work, we're about the action, we're on the ground, we're mayors. So we bring people along by doing the work. So as Mayor Libby mentioned, we're, we're doing the work. So, and when you do it and you demonstrate that, and it will evolve the stories of how you, help people how you can demonstrate that those gaps are actually shrinking, that the disparity gaps are going away, that you have a healthier and a more vibrant community. Everyone wins from that. So I can't, I'm sorry, spend a lot of time on how can we convince somebody? We don't have time for that. People are suffering right now. And so while what we do have are mayors who have stepped up, we have partners who've stepped up to give us access to cash, to help our people. And when we demonstrate that we've been able to help our people, my hope is that I would be able to even divert or not divert, direct public dollars to therefore move from pilot to permanent as Mayor Libby has, has uh, shared. So, you know, excuse me, but I, I just don't have any time nor tolerance for trying to convince somebody after we have been living and especially in the U.S. of A, unbelievable. With all the resources, I mean, come on, we have? It is about redistributing and redirecting to help people bring them along, and we can do that. So that's what I'm about. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that thoroughly. I have a question, a follow-up question for you, Matt Crenjo, which is you, most of you joined this Marriage for Guaranteed Income back before, you know, back in 2020 or even before that. And so my question is, as public servants, you guys have to think about what is good for our city, what's good for my city, right? And so when you're thinking about that, it can be sometimes folks can get swayed into thinking what allows me to keep the job. My, my assumption is that I'm talking to four people who are thinking about how do I do the job? But can you talk a little bit about those tough decisions you have to make before you, you know, before we got to this point right now where 28% went to 45% and there's this momentum, you all were thinking about this back when. So is there anything you can tell us about making that decision to say, look, this is just what I think is right? Or how do, how do you go about that? Or what are, what are the, what's the thoughts you have about well, I think, to do that? Well, first of all, having the opportunity to build relationships and fellowship with um, mayors across the country, right? And being able to, not everyone does it at one time, but you're able to learn from one another. You're able to um, uh, be that inspiration, you know, to your brother and sister mayor and demonstrate that it can work. But making difficult decisions is something that we have to do every single day. And I know in this city, to move your city forward. And with my administration, it just seems like <laughs> making difficult decisions have been a defining aspect of my entire administration over the past uh, three years. But, you know, at every, every juncture, I mean, quite frankly, but we know that these decisions that we make save lives, help people's, you know, lives live a successful life in our cities. And um, I think that we'll continue to demonstrate that. I know in the city of New Orleans, you know, being one of the hot spots in this COVID in the U.S. and you know, being blamed of spreading the virus because of Mardi Gras, you know, all of these different things. But again, um, also being that example of how we flatten the curve and leading the country in vaccination. So it's through tough decisions. And um, no, for me, it's definitely not about keeping the job. I think if you do the job, then that'll help you keep the job. And that's just been my experience. Yeah, I just want to add a leader's job is to make people uncomfortable. We are not changing at a sufficient pace if we are not making people feel uncomfortable. That's our jobs. And uh, 
you know, I, I've had to defend our decision to target by race, uh, you know, a, a national TV, but it is good that we are having that conversation, that we are calling racism what it is. And, and the, the inextricable link between poverty and racism is so clear to those of us. And, you know, I can never say it the way, uh, Mayor Cantrell, I just love how you talk about the urgency of being uh, a mayor. I like to say that we don't have time for partisan gridlock, that really mayors are not Democrats or Republicans. We all belong to one political party. It's the party of get shit done. Uh, so hopefully people feel that sense of urgency uh, and that's what drives us to, to do these jobs in the first place. And something I think about often is people think of Cambridge and, you know, there's the Harvard, there's MIT, and that's what gets talked about. And the reality is it's a tale of two cities, right? So keeping that at the forefront that we have, we have poverty, we have people who are struggling to eat, right? In, in this city that does have, you know, we have, we have a huge budget. Um, you know, we're a triple bond rating, you, you, you name it, but the reality is on the ground. Um, there are people who, um, there, there's, there's so much need. So I think, you know, we keep that at the forefront um, and in getting things done of, we know it's urgent. And so it's, 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 it's really not that hard in, in, that, in that way, because that's what, you know, is in our hearts when we're, and in our minds as we're pushing these policies is the people who, with the lived experiences um, who, uh, are who, who are our focus. Thank you for that. Uh, Adam, if we keep Michael. trying the same thing over and over, expecting different results, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we need to try something not just a little bit different, but radically different mm -hmm. uh, because the, the problem is growing. The, the gaps are widening, that whether mm -hmm. it's income or wealth or health disparity or educational disparity, and they're all widening. So Let's not keep trying the same thing over and over. Let's let's try something different, um, and and hope for different outcomes. Yeah, I have two more questions that I want to ask before I jump into the Q and A uh, and what the, the attendees uh, have that they would like to put out there. The first is this idea of the connection between guaranteed income and health equity. I know you, Mayor Poe, mentioned already just how how deeply connected they are. Uh, and so anyone who wants to kind of speak to what you see as that connection. And the second is this idea of what are the contours in your mind of a better safety net? I know Mayor Schaff, you talked about like, yeah, let's interrogate jobs guarantee and all the other things, but recognize that this is working and this is uh, addressing issues of inequity. So feel free to answer one, both, either, none. I will ask Mayor Poe if you will at least just address the uh, health equity element. <laughs> sure, <laughs> um, I'm scribbling down. Um, so uh, we we know that uh, the 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 health disparities um, that exist for people living in poverty are tremendous. Um, you know, and and we've been uh, learning more about this and 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 trying to react to this in Gainesville. Uh, for several years now, we actually created something called a community paramedicine program where we use our uh, firefighters and our, our paramedics to identify our most frequent users of 911 and the, um, uh, the most frequent users of our, our emergency room and identify uh, what their actual, I mean, we had people calling 911 every single day, the same household. Um, that, that's not a health problem. That's a social problem. Right, that, that there, there's something else or usually many other things going on in their lives that are causing them to, to need to call 911 or go to the emergency room. Um, and, and the one thing that they all have in common is they're living in poverty. And uh, so we know that these disparities exist. Uh, we, we know that the traditional system of healthcare does not work for people in poverty. Uh, it, it is designed to uh, extract uh, as much money as possible from healthy people. Um, and so they recruit those uh, 
customers <laughs> to to use their system and uh, our, our sort of social safety net healthcare providers are um, absolutely overextended, uh, under-resourced, uh, and, and unable to deliver the, the uh, quality and quantity of healthcare that they would like to. Um, so we need to look at other ways of, of helping those individuals because the, the traditional system is broken, has been for some time, um, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. And so uh, one way to get at those uh, problems is by putting money in people's hands uh, so they can, um, they can uh, seek uh, preventative treatment if they need it. And just, again, the mental health outcomes are, are just astounding. I don't think any of us expected what we saw. Uh, um, you know, maybe, maybe stabilizing people's mental health with a guaranteed income, but the significant improvement um, was, was something that was incredibly uplifting. I, I think it shows a better model um, for uh, communities and states outside of the guaranteed income conversation. Um, but we see what people are able to do when they have that agency and are able to make the best decisions for themselves on, on physical health and mental health outcomes. Uh, and, and you know, I asked earlier what makes the argument to a broader population. To, to me, it's going to be that and it's going to be the jobs argument. But I mean, when people realize that, that, that you're saving lives and improving uh, health for, for families, um, I think most people care about that and, and, and will want to support uh, programs that, that encourage that. Hey, I just have to chime in. Michael Tubbs always says, guaranteed income, it's better than Prozac. Uh, so, you know, that's a, a, a clever way of, of just really, it, it, none of us expected to see those dramatic outcomes. And it also raises the question of, is poverty actually making people significantly ill? Uh, and I, I'd say yes. Um, the other example I wanted to kind of lift up, Autumn, to your, your question, um, I, I call it tweezer government. Like we've got 20 different programs that are very specific. Uh, I know many of us have heard the story. I think it's told by Mayor Perkins of um, when he and his wife had a child, they qualified for WIC. They could buy all the peanut butter and eggs in the world but their daughter actually had a nut and an egg allergy and they couldn't get almond butter or egg substitute that their child actually could eat safely uh, because the program didn't cover those things. Um, I'll share a story here from Oakland. Uh, we launched something called Keep Oakland Housed to uh, prevent people from falling into homelessness. And one of the very first families that we helped, and, and it is through an, an unconditional uh, some, some unconditional emergency cash. It's unfortunately only one time and that's part of what we need to fix. But, but we had a, a household where the breadwinner was a developmentally disabled adult. And he had been successfully earning money in a job, uh, but the job required him to wear a uniform and to keep that uniform clean on his own. And their household washing machine had broken. Uh, his disability prevented him from being able to navigate a public laundromat or to solve for this problem. Uh, he was unable to keep his uniform clean. He got laid off from work and the, and the family could no longer afford what they had been able to afford independently. There is no government program that buys you a washing machine. That's what this family needed to be self-sufficient. So we were able to not only pay the back rent and back utilities that were owed so this family could stay in their home, but we also bought them a washing machine. That's the kind of, of dignity that our current you know, array of multiple programs that are so targeted uh, just does not address. Wow, incredibly powerful. I. I want to segue into asking some of the questions that were posed by participants because I know we're coming towards our end and I want to honor their uh, inquiries here. Let's see. This is a quick one, which is just, are 
any of your pilots or do you know of any pilots that are geared towards those who are homeless or housing insecure? I mean, ours will be um, a little, I mean, it, so we're targeting people returning from incarceration, which many of those folks are there are up against homelessness. Um, so, it's, but it's not specifically targeting homeless folks. Um, but I think it will prevent a lot of what otherwise would be homelessness. Yeah, I agree. I think um, with the focus on 16 to 24 year olds that are not attached to school nor work, and then when I look at our homeless population among youth, uh, it is our intention uh, to be able to work with and elevate uh, young people who are experiencing homelessness as well. I think this, you know, there's a holistic approach here. We are doing outreach in our homeless communities, but it's not limited to homeless. Um, it, it is something that we'll see if we can get enough of a critical mass to, to actually pull some statistical evidence out. But I'm hoping that some of our narrative work might lift up uh, someone who at the time they received this benefit was experiencing homelessness. Uh, just to be clear, in Oakland, we're actually gonna have two groups one group will be in the kind of bottom quartile of income, but we're actually geographically focusing that cohort of 300 families in deep East Oakland, which is one our, probably our most stressed part of our city. The rest of the participants will be in the bottom kind of one eighth of income earners in our city at 25% of the area median income, uh, those we will pull from citywide. And I, I would be very surprised if we do not have homeless individuals in that cohort. Next question is related to what comes next. And I think you alluded to this, Nosha, this idea of, do you have ideas about making these initiatives or pilots ultimately permanent? And I'm gonna just put in my own tweak here, which is, do you see that, oops, lost. Um, do you see that as something that is, uh, be, something that continues for the individuals who receive it, as in some sort of way of extending money that is received by those who are in the pilot, or do you see it as reaching more people through additional pilots? Or, None of those. All right, if no one's gonna talk, I'll jump in. Look, the big prize is federal policy. Uh, we're all struggling here at the local level. Uh, we have to actually pass a balanced budget every year. The federal government is the only layer of government that gets a credit card. Uh, they are like racking up a bill on their credit card this year in a way that is so inspirational and is probably you know one of the best uh, investments that a government could make coming out of of a of a horrific year like the one we've had. Uh, but that that is the layer of government that can actually do entitlements and can guarantee uh, this investment year after year. There are some glimmers of hope for that policy path. Uh, we are seeing an expansion of the earned income tax credit and the young child tax credit. But let's be honest, you don't get that benefit unless you file your taxes, which you know is another big barrier for a lot of people who would otherwise qualify and who need guaranteed income. However, this kind of unconditional cash payments, these stimulus checks, this, this expansion of tax credits, this is promising signs for those of us who are in the, in the thick of things uh, that shows you know, a change, a shift at the federal level that really does uh, show hope. Uh, another one is uh, a look at housing choice vouchers, making those universal. Now that's not unconditional cash, but it's again, moving to entitlement to address poverty at scale. That is something we need the federal government to do. Uh, I think we're seeing a movement at the state and local levels, but at the end of the day, the federal government and an entitlement is what we really, really need. And a to put oh, an ahead. exclamation point on, on Mayor Schaaf's uh, 
uh, statement there. I mean, we really are hoping to build a narrative for federal uh, support for this. Um, for our program, we're also hoping that this is the bridge that helps people become self-sufficient and financially sustainable in the long term. And, and, and we're getting that. Again, our, our program was designed uh, by the impacted parties that will be receiving this. Um, and so we asked them, what would make a difference uh, to you? What, what would help you ensure that you were sort of stable and they said $600 a month, uh, ideally for 24 months. Um, you know, we said, would 12 be okay? They said, it would be all right, but really it takes a little more than a year to get everything sort of stabilized. And so we, we're hoping that by the end of those 24 months with this program, you know, they will be full-time jobs, stable housing, um, you know, healthcare uh, well, you know, in hand uh, and, and will be, uh, doing well. Um, so, you know, yes, yeah, some of these are pilots designed to sort of test out some theories and, and see what works. Uh, some of this is just that that bridge that people need to get to a, a self-sufficient lifestyle without support. And, and we're going to learn different things from different pilots, um, you know, when it comes to, to that kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a uh, colleague or former colleague who used to call it a, a safety trampoline, uh, Wei Fastino, who would talk about making sure it kind of bounce people back up to a place of, of uh, stability and security. Stealing. <laughs> Wei Fastino. <laughs> um, and so uh, I have a, question, a few questions here that are related to reparations. So they say, do you think that GI can be successful in the long run if we don't have a conversation about truth and reconciliation with the legacy of slavery and how it has harmed this nation? What are your thoughts on the need for the connection to uh, HR 40, which uh, I believe is about reparations? So as the only Southern cohort left <laughs> on the call, let me jump in. Um, so, you know, we, we uh, take truth and reconciliation very seriously in Gainesville and our county, Alachua County. Uh, we are working with the uh, Equal Justice Initiative um, and, and are, are well engaged and well along uh, the path towards uh, truth and reconciliation. It's a very difficult and uncomfortable process. We're having those difficult public conversations. Um, including, you know, what, what do reparations look like? Uh, what does, uh, how does equity fit into that? Um, you know, uh, so I think it's important to uh, name that as part of uh, our um, needs as, as a nation and as in a community when we, when we talk about guaranteed income. Um, you know, the way our pilot was designed, it, it's really addressing a different problem. That's a, uh, a, a legacy of, of white supremacy and racism in, you know, in our um, city, in our county, our state, our nation. Uh, and, and so we are addressing a, a part of that legacy, uh, but I don't know that our program would be considered uh, reparations. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that that uh, is being elevated to a, a more um, front and center national conversation uh, as we talk about guaranteed income as well. Yeah, and I think I'll just add that, you know, everything is connected. Uh, and, you know, in Cambridge, uh, we look at who is in deep poverty. Um, you know, it is our black and brown communities and there's a historical context there um, in many ways. And um, we see who, um, you know, is living in affordable housing. We see, you know, even who, uh, we have a lot of home ownership programs. You know, we're looking at, you know, how, who, who's actually applying to these programs. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing is, is we're seeing more white families are benefiting. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think, this is a, it's a really important conversation. I think we, we've we started and we're, we're talking about it, um, but I, in my view, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of connections and um, some, you know, deep learning to come from the guaranteed income pilot 
as well. So I see a few questions that are about how you've done the evaluation, how you've done some other um, kind of kind of some more specifics. And so what I will say to anyone who is curious about that, when we send our follow-up email, I can put some links to some of the kind of stats and uh, details. Uh, but what I would love to do in this last four minutes is just ask each of you to share anything else that you have kind of as a parting thought for, for those are, who are joining us. Um, so we'll, thank you for uh, doing this, New America. Uh, it's important to um, spread the word. Uh, I, I'm so uh, humbled and uh, excited to uh, work with so many in, in amazing mayors, um, you know, uh, like my colleagues that were on this call, but we're over 50 strong now around the nation um, and growing every day at a, a meeting uh, with Cameron and the mayor of Tallahassee, Florida, our, 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 our tribal uh, yesterday to try to uh, bring them on board. Um, and, and we just, we need to grow this movement. It, it is an amazing opportunity to completely rewrite the narrative and support our brothers and sisters uh, that deserve every bit of respect and dignity. Uh, they deserve uh, to have agency over their own lives. And this is uh, just an incredible opportunity to uh, show how a guaranteed income and direct cash assistance uh, can, can achieve those goals. Thanks, Mayor Poe. Yeah, for me, I think I'm, I want to thank you, Autumn, and every, it's, it's such an honor to be here with all the, the rest of you. I, you know, I think about this and I think about the, this, this notion we're giving people, um, you know, greater flexibility to make decisions for their lives, right? And th they know how to make. Um, and, uh, you know, I, that so much has been mentioned um, about the, these stereotypes. Um, and uh, then we see the data on the ground and really what is actually happening. And I think the more stories we have, the more anecdotal and data, it's really powerful. Uh, and I think um, building on Stockton. So that's why uh, it's an amazing um, thing to be a part of. Uh, and we'll be hearing directly from uh, constituents who uh, who can provide, uh, you know, their lens um, and how important this is. And so th that's really critical. And so I'm really excited to be part of it. Uh, in, in Oakland, I, I just want to underscore the sense of urgency and possibility. Um, this idea that poverty is a policy failure, not a personal failure, and that it is having untold impacts on the health and well-being of our communities cannot be said enough. We just got through this year where while it was so full of, of loss and suffering, it also was full of amazing resilience. We saw our whole country come together with a sense of urgency and determination to stop people from being harmed. We need to bring that same sense of urgency and this knowledge that we can actually do amazing things when we put our collective minds to it and we put public resources where they belong to actually stop suffering and death. And, and I believe guaranteed income is at that place of urgency and possibility and that there's an appetite for radical imagination like we've never had before, uh, and that we've built this muscle of collective impact, uh, and that we need to seize this moment to make this kind of transformational change. That's what excites me. Well, I have nothing to add to what the three of you have said. I just want to thank you again for being here. Thank you for your hard work and your passion for whatever it takes to help make sure that residents of your communities, our communities are able to, to thrive. Thank you. <laughs>